Welcome back to Class Act, Updates in Education Law. I'm Miriam. I'm Lisa. We are attorneys at Walter Haverfield in Cleveland, Ohio. And every few weeks we get together and we talk about the latest legal developments in education law, cases and regulations and laws and developments that are relevant to school board members, administrators, teachers, anybody who works in our school districts. Yeah, and today we're going to continue our conversations about students with special education needs. And we are going to look very specifically at um, our top independent educational evaluation questions that we get from districts about when those are required, what they need to look like, and things like that. And we have John Mink joining us again, uh, one of our law clerks and third year law student with a background in special education and as a school administrator. So thank you for joining Welcome us Welcome back. Glad to be back. Okay, so I'm sure most of our audience is familiar with IEEs, Independent Educational Evaluations, but I'll just run through this concept quickly. Um, parents of students who have been evaluated for a special education sometimes disagree with the district, with the school district, about that evaluation. They're sometimes displeased with the results. Maybe their, maybe their child was, did not qualify and they disagree. Or maybe they, the, the parents might disagree about the battery of tests completed or that some other assessments should have been done or shouldn't have been done. For whatever reason, they disagree with their child's evaluation and the law says that those parents are entitled to one independent evaluation paid for by the school district. So a separate person or organization or company uh, conducts an evaluation and the district has to pay for it. And that's called an IEE, an independent educational evaluation. Right, and as you can imagine, these requests can be very contentious. I mean, from the beginning, you're in a conflict, right? The parents disagreeing with your evaluation. So we're already in a contentious yeah. situation. Already, yeah. So there um, generally are a lot of emotions kind of running there. Um, but we have a lot of questions come up. One about when are these required? Do I really have to all the time just because parent wants one? So let's dive into some of those specific questions. Today. That we commonly get, yeah. 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 So the first question is whether parents can request an IEE uh, ahead of an evaluation. Yeah, and, so, and that's a good question. We get that sometimes. You know, the, the parent will say, you know what, I, I don't like this team and I don't like this district and I wish my kid was somewhere else anyway and I'm, I'm just going to, I just want somebody else to do this evaluation. I don't like the school psychologist. I, I want somebody else to do it. Um, and um, sometimes we get that, that kind of question, the parent who's in general dissatisfied with her child's team. Sometimes we also get that question from somebody who moved in recently. So some, let's say a parent moves into your district and there's an evaluation from some other district that, that, that the parent just moved from, but now the mom is asking you to pay for an evaluation, um, an outside, an IEE, an independent educational evaluation, because she's not happy with something that the other district did. And the answer to, to both of those situations is no. So the school district typically uh, will not fund an IEE unless the, the school district has had a chance to first conduct their own evaluation. Right, so to clarify, for example, a student who has not yet been identified, a parent can't just say, I don't trust the district to do it, so I want you to pay somebody else to conduct the evaluation, and mm -hmm. because I have a right to an IEE, you need to fund this. The district needs to conduct their own evaluation first, and then that provision and that parent right kicks in. That's right. Um, so. What about a parent's reasoning or explanation for why they don't like an evaluation? Do they have to explain themselves or provide rationale behind this? So that's a really good question. I know a lot of districts really want to know, okay, what didn't you do agree with with this evaluation? Or you said you agreed at the meeting and now a couple months later you're saying you don't disagree. You know, can you tell me why? And it is okay for the district to ask the parent those questions of what don't you agree with, but the parent doesn't have to give any explanation. Really the key component is parent just expressing that they don't agree with it generally and globally, and that's enough to kick in that right to have it funded by the district. Okay, and so can a parent just bring this up whenever after the evaluation or is there a statute of limitations? Yeah, you know, so that's another good question. Um, the, the special education laws and regulations don't really establish a specific deadline, but typically the, the, the cutoff by the Department of Education has been about 
two years, a little over. So if a parent is asking for an IEE two years after the district, more than two years after the district has completed its evaluation, that's too long. And I think that that makes sense because we know that school districts are obligated to conduct a reevaluation every three years. So if you're if you're over two years from the last evaluation, it, it doesn't make sense for the parent to be entitled to a, to a district-funded outside independent educational evaluation. Yeah, and certainly I think that two years kind of is in alignment with our two-year statute of limitations for mm -hmm. due process complaints. Sure. So the period of time a parent can complain about the evaluation through that process. So it's I think two that years, two years yeah. makes sense. Um, but we also have situations where maybe it's two and a half years. So you had mentioned we ha we're on three-year reevaluation mm -hmm. cycles, right? Mm -hmm. So a district is obligated to conduct their own every three years. Mm -hmm. um, if one is requested, say, two and a half years out, mm -hmm. and you're past that, then you, you don't have to necessarily agree to complete that IEE and fund it. What I would generally recommend, and you're going to want to be in um, contact with your council because this can get nuanced, is looking at, okay, we're gonna, we need to do our evaluation first, and then you're entitled to an IEE. And I mean, you kind of know from the onset, right, most parents then are going to Challenge, request yeah. that so you kind of know that but you really are going to want to make sure you have the most current information as a district through your evaluation and have an opportunity to do that um, so when you get mm -hmm. into beyond the statute of limitations you really are going to want to be careful and invoke um, some counsel from your legal yeah. counsel as far as how yeah. to do that um, and how to navigate that. I think that's very important to, to talk to your attorneys when you are um, about to tell a parent, no, we're not going to fund your IEE request. I think that's it's critical to be in touch with your attorneys, and here's why. Typically, um, you know, in this in this statute, in this provision, typically the parent does get the IEE funded um, because for the district, the way the law is written, the other option for the district, if if the district does not want to fund the IEE. The other option for the district is to file due process, which is, which is unusual. Um, in special education law, most of the time, it's the parent who's dissatisfied and the parent who's filing a due process complaint you know, with the state, um, alleging that, that the district did something wrong, didn't educate their child. Here, the, the IEE regulations create a situation where the district is the one bearing the burden to defend the evaluation. So if you're a school district and you want to tell a parent, no, we're not going to fund your IEE request for this reason or that reason, um, most of the time you have to follow that up with right away filing a due process complaint to say our evaluation was great and we don't need to uh, fund an IEE in addition to having done our evaluation. We don't need to do that. So those situations where you're not going to file a due process complaint and you're still going to deny the parent's request are unusual and they're very rare. And, and that's why I would say talk to your attorney. If you're in the situation of denying a parent request for an IEE, you're, you're on the brink of filing due process, possibly. So speak to your counsel before you do that. And that's a really important distinction. So because parent has a right to this district-funded IEE, there is a mechanism, and that mechanism is due pro a due process complaint for the mm -hmm. district to say, no, we're not going to provide that. But very often districts are not going to want to go through the time expense yeah. process of doing that because then they are um, the the individual or party that is responsible for defending that evaluation. Very costly, very expensive to go to due process. Right, and sure. you're defending this is an appropriate evaluation. Um, so more times than not, we do see districts just agree to fund. It's almost the path of least, least resistance, resistance, a little less contentious, um, and then obviously you're getting that IEE and reviewing the results. So just to double check, Yeah. yeah. district gets an IEE request. Mm -hmm pretty much their options are fund it, mm -hmm. 
or go to due process. Generally, yeah. yes. Yeah, and you know, some districts try to um, just get out of that. They don't, you know, they don't like those two options. So <laughs> uh, sometimes we'll see districts that try to say, oh, you know, um, if you don't like it, we can we can redo it. Or if there's some other assessments that you wanted, mom, we can have our school psychologist do those. Um, that's not an appropriate response. The, the appropriate response is to say, yes, we will fund this IEE, or no, we're going to go to due process, and I'm, I'm calling my attorney right now. <laughs> but, but to the other end of that, too, yeah. there are, so this is where it gets nuanced, because there are situations, say, your initial evaluation didn't include a related service area, maybe, mm -hmm. and that's come up. The parent's not necessarily going to have a right to the IEE if you've never had an opportunity since that area has been suspected to even conduct that evaluation. So when you get into kind of those nuances too, make sure you have your counsel yeah. involved in Speak those discussions as well. Very individual cases, yes. So I imagine though that the parents would request the top of the line most expensive mm -hmm. evaluation. Sometimes. So what happens when parents and districts disagree about the examiner or the cost of the evaluation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of times parents do have their eyes set on a specific evaluator who, yeah, may range in cost in that. Um, the district should generally have a list of qualified examiners that they can provide to the parent um, within the general location and with reasonable cross cost criteria. But parents don't also have to generally select specifically from that list. They're almost like recommendations. So there are situations where parents can select a different examiner, um, but that examiner is still going to have to meet the basic evaluator criteria and qualifications that the district team had to meet. So for example, if in your board policy, um, it lists certain criteria of certain training or things like that, that outside evaluator has to meet those requirements Yeah, as parents well. cannot just say, look, here's, here's my neighbor and my best friend. He doesn't have any, any, any educational qualifications or any testing qualifications, but he'll be very happy to evaluate my son for $10,000. Right. <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not, that's not a reasonable um, request. So are parents limited though to um, using the people that the district's uh, qualification criteria and location? Mm -hmm, that's a good question. That's a good question. So, so, so um, the district always has to allow for exceptions. So the district, uh, a school district can definitely have um, geographic constraints and, and reasonable, um, a list of qualified examiners, and we'll talk about cost in a minute, reasonable cost parameters. But a parent always has to have the chance to explain why an exception should apply. And this, this might be you know, a child that has some very unusual medical needs or some kind of complex involved in involvement. Um, and the parent should be able to say, should be able to explain, look, uh, I, my child um, doesn't fit into these categories or the evaluators that you have here or the geographic location parameters that you've set um, are, would be inappropriate to, uh, to evaluate my child's needs. And as you pointed out, it, that often is rare yeah. that that actually needs to be approved mm -hmm. by the district, but you absolutely have to open the, be open to the conversation and sure. the request and determine if it is appropriate for that child. But there also are some criteria that a district just flat out can't put on yeah. choose a parent for choosing a provider. Mm -hmm. um, so some of those things might be um, unaffiliated with private schools or parent organizations. Mm -hmm. You can't say the provider can't have those connections. Um, the and you know, you can kind of see why some districts would want to put that yeah. in. Of course, you know, if you're, if you're concerned that um, an evaluator that has a connection to a private school is now going to evaluate this child, as the district you might be, you might be thinking, oh, okay, so they're going to they're going to evaluate this child and then of course recommend them to go to this private school at, at a huge cost to my district. So I'm just going to say no to that IEE evaluator right. and I'm going to put in my policy that the, the evaluator has to be unaffiliated with any private schools and that's not allowed. You can't set that criteria. Yeah. Another thing you can't do is require that that evaluator must have experience specifically in public schools. Mm -hmm. So, and again, you can see why a team would want the evaluator to have that experience, mm -hmm. but as long as they're qualified in other ways, mm -hmm. you can't put that restriction 
Mm -hmm. um, you also can include like an age or grade level score requirement for the report mm -hmm. um, or the, the eye examiner has to attend the IEP meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are important, important criteria that some districts have tried to include and those have been struck down by hearing officers. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so about a cost cap, yeah. is right. that the, the, the same thing? Parents must be allowed to show an exception to that or how yes. does that work? Yes, so pretty much that's correct. So generally school districts uh, may set reasonable cost containment criteria and prohibit unreasonably excessive fees. Now that doesn't mean that you can just say whatever the average is in your community. So I'm sure communities are different and you can you but you cannot say look the average cost for an IE and the average cost for an evaluation in our community is $2000. So $2000 is the most that we're going to pay. You cannot you cannot set an uh, a cost criteria that is just simply an average. It has to be kind of a range but once again parents have to have the chance to explain um, why their particular situation is an exception and uh, to show that their unique circumstances essentially justify a more expensive evaluation and and the difficult part about this for districts is that if the district disagrees with with the parents on this again the district's option is to file a due process complaint, which right. can be costly and time consuming and resource consuming. So right. more often than not, we see districts acquiescing because w typically even an expensive IEE is going to be less time consuming and costly than a due process hearing. Right, and the key kind of component of that analysis is if parents asking for a higher, that you fund a higher cost, and you're saying no, you're in essence denying their yeah. um, IEE request. Yeah. And thus the same process and mechanism goes into place of then you need to file due process. Yeah. So that's where it does get more nuanced um, at that point. So that's our episode on IEEs. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, John. And um, next time we will be talking about something interesting and exciting in the world of education law. Please join us uh, next time. And in the meantime, give us high marks. Give us high ratings on iTunes and Stitcher. Have a great day. Thanks for listening.